Right. Thank you, Sam. Now we're moving. Um, so welcome. Um, this is a webinar on open access sharing your scholarship by Anna Kraft, our UNCG Libraries Coordinator of Metadata um, Services. And um, I will mute now. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks everybody for being here. Happy New Year and welcome to 2021. Um, I'm glad that y'all are all here to learn about open access. So I'm going to stop my video um, just to kind of cut down on any potential bandwidth issues. Um, and as Sam said, she'll be monitoring the chat and I am glad to answer questions if you've got questions that are that you come up during the presentation and I will also be glad to answer them at the end. I put the link to the slides in the chat if you'd like to follow along and we will also share the uh, slides afterward. So this is me. Um, I'm the coordinator of metadata services in the university libraries and that chicken is not mine. Um, her name is Spicy Chicken, um, but I am glad to have her in that picture with me. So this is what we're doing today. We're going to talk about what open access is, what benefits it can offer to you, how you can share your work via open access. We'll talk about support that the university libraries offer in this area. And of course, we will answer questions. And I would love to know from y'all what your experiences are with open access. So feel free to type in the chat um, any of these things that you have done or other things that you have done related to open access. Um, I know some of y'all may have gotten awards through the Open Access Publishing Fund. I think some of y'all are in NC Docs. Um, some of you may have published gold OA articles. And if you don't know what that is, don't worry, we will talk about that a little later. Um, if open access is something that's important in your courses or you use OER, also feel free um, to type that in. Awesome, Sarah says she has used NC Docs. I think there are several people in here who have done that. Great, and if you don't know what NC Docs is, that is okay. We will talk more about that a little later in the presentation. So um, I'm not gonna go through everything on this list right now, but this, this is just for y'all's reference. There are some acronyms in this presentation. I'm going to try to explain them as I come to them, but in case you need a quick reference, this is in the slides um, so you can refer back to it. Uh, so what is open access? A very basic definition that I like from Wikipedia is research outputs which are distributed online and they're free of cost or other barriers. So there's two important things here. The research or the scholarship is online, so it's available to anyone who has an internet connection, and there's nothing like a paywall or anything that they have to sign into. People can just access that scholarship. Why is this important? Because open access materials are very discoverable or findable and available, it really accelerates the discovery of people finding them because there's no barrier there. It enriches the public because anyone with an internet connection can uh, access those materials. And it improves education because these things are available and can be incorporated into courses and just education at any level. There are misconceptions out there about open access, uh, that open access means if you have money uh, and you wanna publish anything, uh, you can just pay to get it published. That authors don't retain copyright, that publications aren't peer reviewed, and that these publications are not indexed in scholarly databases. And none of these are necessarily true. There may be situations where some of these are true, but across the board, these are not true about open access. So we're gonna talk more about money in a minute. Um, so hold that thought, but with copyright, there doesn't have to be necessarily uh, authors signing away their copyright with open access publishing. With many open access journals, authors actually retain their copyright, but you wanna be sure to look at the journal's policy uh, before you submit your work so that you know what you're getting into. 
with peer review, any legitimate OA journal should have peer review standards that are comparable to other journals that you may be considering, toll access or subscription access or traditional journals. Again, you wanna look for the policy. And indexing, so this is where journals and their content, their articles are included in, in major indexing services um, like Web of Science or Scopus or others that are out there. These help uh, discovery, help people find them. So many OA journals are indexed. Um, the journal should be transparent about where it is indexed. So, there's a major difference between open access scholarship and traditional or toll or subscription access scholarship. Does anybody know what that is? And I'm looking back at the chat yet. Thanks to y'all who uh, typed in. So awesome, a fellowship that requires work published uh, through with their funding be open access. That's becoming more common. Um, yes, costs. We will definitely be talking about costs more. Um, and that actually leads into this. So the answer to this question, in open access publishing, the bills are not paid by the readers, so they don't function as access barriers. Who has run into something like this before? So this is a paywall. Um, this is where I was trying to get to an article and it's not something that we subscribe to in the university libraries. So I could choose to pay um, for 48 hour access for $51 for that article, or I could purchase the whole issue for 30 day access for about $200. That's a lot of money. Um, if I needed say 10 articles or 100 articles, or I wasn't even sure if I needed this article, but I wanted to look at it to find out if it was relevant, this is could be very, very expensive. Um, so yeah, it's, it's wild. Um, scholarship is very expensive, but open access removes these paywalls that stand between readers and content. So let's talk more about the benefits. So we looked at this earlier, accelerated discovery, public enrichment, improved education, and a little detour here. So open access and education, there's a subset of open access called open educational resources. And these are teaching, learning, and research resources that are in the public domain or that have been released under an intellectual property license that permits their free use and repurposing by others. So this OER, these materials are not just openly available for people to read, they are openly available for people to use and potentially change. So OER is a subset of open access. Open access is available to read online uh, for anyone, OER, has an open license that allows different and often uh, more significant types of uses and repurposing. So we're not gonna talk about OER in depth today, but we've got our library um, experts in OER who are on this call today, Sam and Melody, who do a lot of work with OER, but these are some of the reasons that OER is important. It makes textbooks and other content affordable for students. It makes content much more customizable for faculty, and it makes educational materials and educational um, other things to support education available for everyone. And if you need help with OER, you, we've got a great LibGuide that Melody and Sam run, and we've got a lot of other support resources for OER. So um, don't hesitate to check this out if it's something that you are interested in. But what else can open access to you, specifically for me and my scholarship? So there is, uh, there's not consensus about how much this open access citation advantage is, but there are a significant number of studies out there that show that articles that are made available through open access have higher citation counts than those that are published through toll access. 
So these are some recent studies and the numbers are pretty different, but 8%, 19%, 40%, um, these are all, uh, you can't have, you know, half of a citation. So these are all looking at like whole numbers um, and even an 8% increase in the number of citations that you're getting, that's, uh, could be pretty significant for people. Um, so I know that when I'm publishing scholarship, I definitely want it to be read and cited. And knowing that if I make it available openly, that will contribute to having higher citation counts is a motivator for me. So again, there's not consensus about the exact percentage, and there may be some disciplinary factors and other things that impact these numbers, but enough studies have been done that have repeatedly shown that there is an advantage to publishing open access and getting more citations um, that I think this is definitely something to consider. But there are other considerations specifically related to money and other things. Um, so it's really up to you about deciding how you want to publish and share your scholarship. But let's talk more about money. So it's free for readers to access, but it is definitely not free to produce or publish. And these are some models that you may run into with open access publishing. Traditional OA is when you've got a fully open access journal, all of their content is published openly. And there are still costs associated with every step of, step of this, just like you would have with a subscription-based journal. So they have online systems, they have people who are serving in various roles who may be compensated or may be doing this as part of their professional service. Um, there may be indexing costs. So there is uh, there are costs in terms of time and potentially money for this work. And with a subscription-based journal, those costs are being paid through generally subscriptions or maybe advertising. Um, with an open journal, the journal production costs may be funded by subsidies through institutions, by what's called article processing charges, which we'll talk more about in a moment, potentially through advertising, through institutional membership, membership fees. Um, this is also called gold OA. So when the whole journal is always published openly, it's called gold OA. There's also hybrid OA, which is where you have maybe a, a, a what's called a closed journal, but some authors may be electing to pay article processing charges to make just their content available openly. There is delayed open access where a journal may be closed for the initial like 12, 18 or 24 months after publication, but then that content would become available openly. And there's also what's called green open access um, or self archiving, where it's not happening on the part of the journal, but the author is electing to post copies of their work, which is published elsewhere in an institutional repository, a subject specific repository, or other repository. Not all publishers and journals support self archiving. So this is something that you want to think carefully about as an author in terms of what you are allowed to do. And article processing charges. So these are author side payments of processing fees to the publisher. These are common in hybrid and fully open access journals, those gold OA journals. These can in many situations be paid by the author's funding agency or employer, but not always. Uh, so these generate income to cover publishing costs that might otherwise be covered by subscriptions. They can sometimes be funded through financial awards or credits. And I'm going to talk more about the library's support for this, including some new and pretty exciting support that we've got uh, later in the presentation. And in pretty rare situations, APCs may be waived in cases of financial hardship or geographic location of the researchers if they are in a geographic situation where they really would not have institutional support or other support and might not otherwise be published. Uh, in most cases, I would not recommend that uh, researchers in this country apply for to the publisher for uh, their APC to be waived based on geographic location. But if you are collaborating with 
say, a research partner in a third world country. This actually happened to one of our researchers relatively recently. They were collaborating with uh, partners in another country uh, who had planned to pay those APCs, but then they, their partners lost funding due to COVID. Um, so I suggested that they consider sharing that information with the publisher to, uh, I mean, it can't hurt to sort of ask if there's anything that the publisher can do in terms of waiving or lowering the cost of those APCs. They may not do it, but you can always ask. APCs can really vary. They can be as little as a couple hundred dollars. This is pretty uncommon. They can be as much as like $6,000, which also thankfully is uncommon. They average, according to the literature, around $2,100 to $2,700, which is a lot of money. Um, and these prices sadly appear to be rising faster than inflation. Publishers and journals should be transparent about what they are expecting authors to pay. So you want to know up front before you submit your manuscript if the journal or publisher is going to be charging you an article processing charge. And if they aren't clear, reach out to them in advance and find out. And if they won't share that information with you, I would recommend that you do not submit your work to them. So that is a big red flag if they won't share information about APCs or other potential charges. But there are other red flags that you need to be aware of when it comes to open access and other online publishing. So there are journals and publishers out there that we would describe as bad actors, they're predatory or exploitative. This, just, this isn't uh, limited to just open access, but you do see this um, in cases where uh, article processing charges are involved, and that is more common with open access publishing. So this is where the publisher would be charging publication fees to authors, but they would not be providing those services that legitimize that scholarship. So they might, this is really the pay to play situation where um, people we would be submitting their work, it wouldn't be going through peer review, there would be nothing to evaluate or validate that scholarship. And sometimes authors don't realize that that is what's happening because the journal is being exploitative and telling them that there is peer review. Um, so sometimes journals contact authors directly, they can be very aggressive with email uh, submissions or email solicitations. And librarians can help you evaluate the quality of these journals. This is a pretty recent solicitation that I received. This one went directly to spam. So um, it's pretty clear when they go to your spam inbox that there's nothing you need to do with this. But I do like to take screenshots of some of these to share so that people can see uh, an example. So the first red flag for me is that I'm in the library world and this journal is called Applied Psychiatry. I have no qualifications to be writing about anything related to any kind of psychiatry. And another giant red flag here is the subject line, pleasure to have your article. So no legitimate scholarly publication is going to be writing to any scholar with that as their subject line. Um, so you do see some, some pretty clear red flags here. Um, and they, they say that the submitted manuscript will be published for $399. I can also refer colleagues or students who want to submit and publish under the same fee. I definitely do not want to do that. Um, not all predatory journals are this clear in terms of having uh, nonsensical language or soliciting content from people who are outside of their subject area. So it's not always this clear. Um, so you wanna evaluate journals carefully. If it's an unfamiliar journal, look at it carefully before you submit your work. Because if you submit your work first, then it can be very difficult to actually get that work back. And in some cases we have seen publishers go ahead and publish, put up those articles to make themselves look more legitimate. 
um, even without getting paid by the uh, authors that they were trying to charge those APCs to. So keep your work unless you are sure of the journal. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but these are some criteria to look at. We can do a whole talk on evaluating predatory journals, and we actually have done that. Um, so we do have a recording of one of those, but this is also something that I'm glad to do other talks on as needed um, with classes and departments and other groups. Um, but see, these are some of the steps that you can take when you're evaluating journals. So this is what we would call lateral reading. Don't just read what the journal or publisher or even conference, there are sadly predatory conference, conferences. Um, don't read just what they say about themselves, read about what others say. So go to your favorite search engine and search for the name of that journal, publisher or conference along with the word predatory. This is often the first thing that I do when someone asks me about a journal or publisher or conference. And you'll find that other academics out there are uh, often sharing their experiences with bad actors in scholarly publishing. So you, uh, this, is, this is what I would uh, often suggest as step one. Indexing is another thing to look at. So a lot of people start their research with academic indexes in their subject area or in uh, more general ones. Directory of open access journals is a big one for open access publishing. Google Scholar, PubMed, Scopus, others. Some of these systems have pretty rigorous standards for inclusion of content. Um, so a journal can say anything on their own web page. They can say that they're indexed by every system that's out there, but you want you can look and see is their content actually in those systems so if you have access to say scopus or web of science or pubmed go and look and see uh, if they if the journal says that they're in there look and see if you can find their content the directory of open access journals is a great place to start first with this um, they are pretty rigorous with adding open access journals and vetting them before they do. So it's not the only thing that I would look at, but inclusion there is a good sign for journals. There's also a uh, online service called Ulrichs that can show you a list of where specific journals are indexed. So looking at that can be helpful. I find it to be a little bit, um, it's not the friendliest system to new users, so you may want to ask your librarian for help with that one if you have not used it before. You also want to think about content and people. So look at the recent articles of the journal. Are they publishing quality content? Are they publishing content that aligns with the stated subject areas? So if they're a psychiatry journal and they're publishing my articles on librarianship, that's a bad sign. Um, and if you know someone on the journal's editorial board, you might reach out to them and ask about their experience. If you email somebody and they come back and say, wow, I've never heard of that journal. Why am I listed on their editorial board? That's a really bad sign because there are journals out there that will go and just pull information about academics off the internet, off directories and list it on their own sites to make it look like they're legitimate. There are a lot of bad things that journals can do. It's very unfortunate. This is a graphic from SUNY Stony Brook that I like that uh, goes through some of the things to look at. This I realize is very small, but the link is on here and y'all can go back as, uh, as you like and look at this in more detail. And this is another resource that's good. Thinkcheck-submit.org will walk you through the process of evaluating journals. Um, and they've got a checklist, which is on this page, of things to think about and things to look at when you are evaluating a journal. Um, so if you're not sure if a journal is legitimate and you're feeling uncertain about going through these steps, librarians can help. Your liaison librarian can help. I can help. Um, so I've got the link here for the library liaisons and you can also contact me. Um, my contact information will be at the end of the presentation. So that was a lot of information. We've got more, uh, but I wanna stop here and see what questions may have come up. Um, so if you've got any questions, definitely um, feel free to ask. And Sam has been sharing some great info in the chat. 
So it looks like, oh good, all right, they've got grants again for the open educational resources. And um, yeah, lots, lots of links. Thank you for sharing those. So we will keep moving, but if you do have questions, feel free to enter them. All right. So next, how can I share my work through open access? We looked at the publication models earlier. The ones we're going to be uh, concentrating on right now are the traditional or gold OA and the self archiving or green OA and some options there. So with gold OA, your article is immediately open upon a publication. Often this involves article processing charges, which can be expensive. And if you want to go down this route, you want to select a fully open journal or the open access publishing option that is offered by a hybrid journal. With green open access, you can publish your article anywhere in a closed or subscription-based journal. And then you wanna check with their policies. And if they allow it, you can submit your article to an open access repository or post it on your personal website. Not all journals support this. And those that do sometimes require embargoes of maybe 12, 18, or 24 months, or other restrictions about the version of the publication that you can post. How do you figure out publisher policies? So you can look at the website of the journal or publisher. If you can't find that information on their website, you can contact them via email. There's also a good site called Sherpa Romeo, which pulls together information about publisher policies. So this is a screen cap of their main page. You can search by the journal title or ISSN, or you can search by the publisher name. Um, so if you're going down one of these routes, you're gonna be doing some of that legwork yourself. But you can also let the libraries handle this for you. So I'll talk more about how we can help with that as we get into this section. Anna, so, sorry. Yes, um, go ahead. There was a question um, if you wanted to address it before you moved on to the last or the next section. Um, do you want me to read it? Sure. So my field is, um, one of our participants said, my field is early intervention and in autism. Most articles are not published in open access journals. Is the citation chance, um, is if the citation chance is higher, why do scholars still prefer not to publish in open access journals? Is it because not open all open access journals still hold the, more, the most prestige? That's a great question. So, there are, I would say in some fields, people have taken up uh, open access more readily. There are some fields where it is uh, less used. Maybe there are fewer journals that offer open access publishing options. And another thing which is kind of unfortunate is that not all institutions, um, not all universities, not all colleges, um, have uh, departments and uh, you know tenured faculty that support open access. So sometimes people are making a choice about where to publish, not just based on that they're going to be cited more um, or that they want their scholarship to be read and to be accessible, but based on how their peers or uh, their tenured faculty are going to be reviewing them when they go up for tenure. So if they, um, feel that perhaps their tenured faculty group is not looking kindly upon open access, then they are less likely to publish in open access journals. And so this is where libraries and scholars and other researchers have an opportunity for education. Um, I, it's not something that I feel like I can change everyone's mind on this campus. I and mean, there are many people who are very supportive of open access at UNCG, but there are also people who are not and who are probably never going to be. Um, but this is where we want to, you know, offer sessions like this, talk about some of the benefits and share uh, information that's going to help people make good choices. Um, but people also have to think about what's best for them. So if 
what's best for you as an individual is making sure that it's the most prestigious journal that you can possibly get into and that and it turns out that that journal is not open access then maybe that's what you need to do but if you are really committed to open access and it's a great open access journal um, then it is worth thinking about and it's something that perhaps you would want to explain your commitment to open access and explain um, information about the journal and why you have chosen it when you're going up for tenure or review or other processes. So yeah, prestige can be a big factor when people are making these choices. And I hope that answers the question. Um, if not, uh, definitely feel free to write a follow-up. Great, okay. Um, all right, so our next little sections are gonna be about how the libraries can help you with evaluating, finding funding, and with sharing open access scholarship. So I'm not gonna go through all of the details again. We've talked a little bit about, about evaluating already, but these are some of the things that you can use. Um, and if you have questions about any of these in the future, definitely let me know. And again, I want to reiterate, so if you are in doubt about a conference, a journal, a publisher, definitely ask before you submit your work and librarians will be glad to help you. Funding. So this is the part that I'm most excited about talking about today. So many of you, I think, are already aware of the Open Access Publishing Fund. This is um, we offer awards of up to $1,000 to offset the cost of publishing in open access journals and full-time faculty, full-time EHRA employees, and enrolled graduate students are all eligible. You can uh, receive one of these awards in an academic year, and then uh, are certainly welcome to apply for another in the next year. Uh, I, we are aware that $1,000 does not always cover the full APC, um, but there are a couple of other options that I'm gonna be talking about in a moment. So I wanted to share the application form and the LibGuide here if you want more information about the Open Access Publishing Fund. We also have some really interesting new read publish deals or transformative deals. So this is where the library is working directly with academic publishers. And because we are paying them to read, some of their content, we are subscribing to various journal packages. They are working with us to offer incentives for our researchers to publish with them. So this is new, it's very new in the library profession. And it's one of these ways that libraries and publishers are trying to figure out some more sustainable models to um, deal with those costs of open access publishing. So the one, the newest, and I think best deal that we've got, it just started January 1st, is with Cambridge University Press. And in this deal, all articles published that have a primary or corresponding author at UNCG are automatically eligible for open access publishing with no APCs at all. So uh, there are, there's a very small list of Cambridge journals that do not offer open access, but they've got, I think, almost 400 journals that do offer OA publishing. And if you're looking at a Cambridge journal, uh, this would be a great way to go. Um, this is very new, no one has done it yet, but um, we would love for people to start doing this. And there's going to be a whole presentation on the 26th with more details about all of these deals that we've got. So if you're interested in this and you'd like to learn more about how this works, um, think about coming to that presentation on the 26th. We also have uh, a deal with SAGE for a 10% discount on APCs for all UNCG authors who are publishing in SAGE Pure Gold Open Access Journals. These are their fully open access or gold OA journals. 10% is not a lot to get excited about, um, but if you applied to the Open Access Publishing Fund and got $1,000 through that, and then apply and got this discount through Sage for 10%, um, so that would be, it's something. Um, it's not the best, it's definitely not as good as the Cambridge deal, but it is something. Um, 
We also have worked with IGI Global to have a limited number of APC credits that UNCG authors can use for open access articles and book chapters. So there are also what's called BPCs or book processing charges for open access books. Um, so if you're publishing with IGI Global or thinking about publishing with them, especially if it's gonna be in the next couple of months, get in touch with me. Um, we only have a few of these credits and they do actually expire later this year. So we would love for them to be used. Um, so let me know if that's something that you're interested in. And then MDPI is not actually a deal that we have set up. They are a fully open access publisher. Um, they have an institutional program that institutions can join that will allow all of their authors to get a 10% discount on APCs. So we are not actually paying them for any kind of read deal. This is just a deal for authors. And with MDPI, and all journals, they are all publishers, they've got journals of varying levels of quality. So don't think in this case that any journal that's in there is gonna be great. Um, there are some very well-respected ones that are published by MDPI, but there are others that I might caution you against. So definitely evaluate those carefully if you are considering those. If you want more information about these read published deals, there's a whole LibGuide page about them. And then this session that I mentioned a few minutes ago, um, funding open access publishing, support from the UNCG University Libraries is gonna be on Tuesday the 26th at 11 a.m. And um, we would love to see you there. I'll be talking about um, more detail about all of this information. All right. Um, let me look at the chat real quick. Okay, good. Yes, yeah, it is really cool, Sarah. Um, the We're really excited about these read published deals and we're hoping that people will use them um, so that it will be worth it. But it is a little bit experimental, so we are definitely learning and we hope that we'll be able to offer other deals with publishers in the future to help uh, reduce the cost that people are paying for sharing their open access scholarship. All right, so if you want to share your scholarship openly, but we don't have a deal with your publisher or you can't afford the APCs, you can consider sharing via NC Docs. This is our open access institutional repository. It shares scholarship from UNCG faculty, staff, and students. We've got more than 10,000 scho uh, scholarly items in there right now and approximately 60% of UNCG faculty members have got a profile in there with at least one publication attached. So this is something that the library does to collect, preserve, and share the scholarly output of the campus. And we also are working to raise awareness of open access on campus. We also wanna help authors think about their rights um, as they're publishing. And there may be cases where you can work with publishers to retain more of your rights um, so that you could add your work to NC Docs. And there was a comment or question earlier about um, agency mandates for public access to publicly funded scholarship. This is something that, um, that NC Docs can help with as an open access repository. If you need to make your scholarship available because of funder requirements, NC Docs is a great place to consider. So what does this do for you? It provides a stable long-term platform and profile for sharing your scholarship with the world. It shows usage, the download counts of your works, and again, it can fulfill those public access requirements that are mandated by some grantors and funders. So this is the main page. It is not very fancy. We are actually in a slow transition process to a new system. But I also want to note that most people who are finding scholarship through NC Docs are finding it through Google. So while I go to this site like a million times a week, most people who are finding and reading the scholarship that's held in NC Docs are doing searches in Google or Google Scholar and are finding that work there and just going directly to it within NC Docs without coming to this main page. This is a profile in NC Docs for Dr. Bird and the Library and Information Studies program. So this is just an example of what uh, you could consider having on a profile. So 
photo, a little bit of contact information, a brief bio or research statement. And if we scrolled down, we would see a list of all of her publications that are included, as well as links to the full text, which is held in this database. And then, so I did a Google search for one of her publications and it came up right on the first page for me, that link that takes me directly to NC Docs. So the NC Docs results are very visible when scholars are searching for work. Um, so that's something to think about as well. And we have got a lot of people who are getting a lot of views on their work. So Paul Sylvia, I took this screenshot, I think yesterday, and the last time I had updated it a couple months ago, it was at like just under 40,000 views. Now it's at just under 45,000 views. Um, Paul is getting a lot of traction, a lot of views on his works, and he's got almost 170 publications that are in here. Um, so not everybody has numbers that are this big, but a lot of people are finding and looking at scholarship and NC Docs, which I think is really exciting. What formats can it handle? So more, most things that are in there are text-based, like articles or proceedings or case studies. But we can take things like slides or other visual files. And we also can accept multimedia. If you are producing scholarship in another format and you have questions, um, let us know and we'd be glad to talk to you about it. What about copyright, though? So we can't add everything to NC Docs. We can only add publications for which we can get copyright clearance. So if you want to add an article or a book chapter or something else that has been published somewhere else, you can send us that citation or you can send us a copy of the article and we will take care of checking the policies that the publisher has. And again, Sherpa Romeo is one of the systems that we use for this. Um, we check with the publisher, see if we're able to add the materials, see if maybe an embargo applies, and then we would either add the material um, or put an embargo notice in there so that we would add it in a year or six months or however long, or in some cases we are not able to add some publications. So if you send us a full list of all of your publications, don't expect that we will be able to add all of them because not all publishers support this, unfortunately. And there are other options that are out there. You may have heard of, you may even have used academia.edu and ResearchGate. Um, many scholars do use those, and I'm not here to tell you to not use them, but they are different than NC Docs. NC Docs works with a lot of other systems, um, systems like OCLC, which harvests content and makes it available to libraries, uh, makes those links available in library catalogs so that work is very discoverable to libraries and patrons all around the world. We support long-term preservation. So if file formats change in the future and some type of file that's in there is no longer going to be accessible. We're committed to migrating file types so that content will remain accessible. Our business model is nonprofit. Um, these other sites, they're commercial and they are hoping either to sell something to you or perhaps to sell your data to someone else. So that may not bother you, which is fine, um, but it is just a different business model. We're not sending you lots of emails by default and we're not asking for your address book. So these are just different models for sharing scholarship. And now um, I would be glad to answer any questions that y'all have. This was a there lot of information. Two, there were two questions about NC Docs. Um, so uh, Bob Strack asked, um, are there metrics for how much NC Docs is getting accessed used? And I. I would guess he uh, means as a whole, um, you know, um, you know, versus the view counts. And then um, someone else asked after that, do we have to have at least one publication to create an NC Docs account? So, okay, let's start with uh, with the metrics. Um, I do get regular reports from our statistical software that lets me know um, what publications are being used the most, where our traffic is coming from. 
and things like that. So we, in addition to those um, individual counts on individual articles, we do have some higher level metrics about the site and um, where traffic is coming from and things like that. And we can track it over time. Um, so yes, we do, we have a fair bit of information about that. Um, and then in terms of having a, a needing a, a publication in order to create a profile, not necessarily. We, uh, we certainly would be able to set up a profile for you if, uh, if you'd like to have one, even if you don't have a publication. Um, Oh, it's fine to, to keep asking questions. Can it be accessed by everyone or only by people at UNCG? So this, everything in NC Docs is open to everyone, um, anyone on the internet. So if you have a profile in there, um, people at UNCG can see it, people who are in Alaska or China or wherever, assuming that their internet is not filtered, um, would also be able to see it. Um, if you're in a graduate program where you're going to be submitting a thesis or dissertation, your, um, your thesis or dissertation will become part of NC Docs after you graduate, unless you request and are given um, an embargo through the graduate school. And that's not something I'm going to go into great detail about today. But if you've got questions about electronic theses and dissertations and NC docs, we would be glad to talk to you about that as well. Um, so for graduate students, if you're in one of those programs, you will definitely get a profile, uh, at least upon graduation. But if you would like to have one sooner, then yes, just send us an email. We would be glad to set one up for you. Um, so if you have questions now or later about general open access, about funding, about evaluating, publishing, or presenting opportunities, or if you want to workshop on these topics for your course or department, um, or if you want to learn about other things, we do a wide variety of presentations on topics related to these, um, or if there's something that we haven't done that you're interested in or that you need, let us know so that we can um, think about creating that content. Okay, so another question, master's thesis from University of Florida, can it be sent to NC Docs? That is a good question. And we actually have had, um, if it is already online in the system that at the University of Florida, that if they've got an institutional repository, then I would say, just go ahead and leave it where it is and don't think about adding it to NC Docs um, because that does get a little bit messy across institutions. We have had people add master's theses or uh, uh, doc doctoral dissertations from other institutions that don't offer any kind of electronic access to their theses and dissertations. Um, but if it's already at the University of Florida, then I think I would probably just go ahead and leave it in their system. But if you're doing future publishing um, while you're in your graduate program, then go ahead and think about sending it to us. We would be glad to get it. And yes, so Sam is mentioning upcoming webinars. We are doing that session on um, funding that we offer for open access publishing. And then later in the semester, I'm also gonna be doing a session on journal quality that's not just looking at bad journals. We, we did recently do a session on predatory journals, but we also wanna look at good journals and ways that you can um, look at what might be the best, uh, most respected or prestigious journals that you could potentially uh, want to choose. Um, is there discussion in library and publishing world about the systemic racism in publishing costs? Yes, um, I am not an expert on that topic, but yes, there are a lot of discussions about publishing and the advantages or disadvantages and barriers that some groups face um, in terms of peer review, in terms of um, a lot of different areas. So yeah, there those are our big areas um, in the library world and you know in, in many, I'm sure in, in your academic discipline as well. Um, so yes, it's a great question. Um, all right. So 
If y'all have additional questions now, feel free to enter them in the chat. You can also unmute if you would like to. Um, and if questions come up at a later time, then definitely send them along. Yes, yeah, Bob's comment, some have ac more access to resources. That is definitely true. And um, people who are in less resourced countries, less resourced institutions, less resourced libraries are definitely at a, they're facing more challenges in terms of getting published, even when they have scholarship that is certainly worthy of publication. Yeah, um, and um, I'm happy to include some links to articles and uh, resources. It's a lot of times talked about in terms of also um, like what Anna was saying, um, third world countries, um, in terms of having access to um, funding as well as um, getting published in general. Um, and then also some of this idea of that, um, some of the workshops on, on um, quality of journals um, can get pretty deep into the systematic racism behind the whole publishing process as well. Um, so I'm happy to um, send anyone who's interested some links. And, um, and when you send that, can you, and can you include, um... Blanking on the name all of a sudden. <laughs> uh, but send it to me, I'll forward it along. I want to make, we've got some groups in HHS that are looking at um, disparities in our practices. And I see this as a very large one. I mean, and this isn't just a third world country thing. We've got, you know, scholars who are make, not making as much money as full professors or any professor. And, you know, $1,000 on a $3,000 publishing fee it's just cost prohibitive. They don't have $2,000 of disposable income for everything that they might get published. And I just see this thing ramping up and ramping up and I'm getting more requests from faculty to say, and students to say, hey, can you help me cover the cost above the $1,000 or the whatever support they're getting requesting. And I, I think it's gonna be a, something that we have to have a deeper conversation with the departments about. And I know you're thinking about it, but I just see this as a slippery slope that's just getting, um, bigger and bigger. And, and it's not to take away from all the benefits that Anne, Anna was talking about for access. I mean, that's true, but the, it's coming out of somebody's hide somewhere. And we all know the publishing world is making more money than they should. And yet, some one thing you left off of your statement, which I think you should begin with and say, we've got some robber barons at the gates of publishing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the the for you. getting into the I had to kind of keep things a little more uh, narrowed down today because I was trying to get through so much information but the the um, finances of academic publishing and the costs are that's a presentation unto itself um, and where the the money is coming from where the money is going and who is making money and who is not making money it um, is shocking in some cases so um, yes, thank you for bringing that up. And it's looking like my video has frozen. So I hope y'all can yeah. still hear me. And um, I think this is a really important conversation to keep having. Um, and like Anna has been saying, we're gonna um, be having that webinar on um, quality journals, like uh, kind of, um, she, you know, she was talking about how she did the predator the, you know, like thinking through what maybe would be a predatory journal. Um, last semester, this semester, Anna's gonna be doing one on like, okay, you have something to get published. What are some things to look for um, in that? Um, so the kind of other side of the coin. Um, and we also have a lot of other things in that webinar series on a variety of things to do with academia where this conversation can um, keep going. But um, again, I'll send you all some emails with some of that literature and I'll CC Anna um, again, it's uh, something that is definitely being talked about, um, especially in terms of EDI and academia um, as well. So yeah, what's up, Bob? Well, I've got a question for you since I, I know you get a few minutes. Um, first of all, you guys are always awesome, so thank you. I mean, I always appreciate everything you do, but um, I do have a couple of requests. One is, can, can you point us to where on the library website this information that you just went through can be found i mean it's one thing to try to dig out a powerpoint from a file that you save to your folder it's another thing to know where to source it on the website 
Yeah, yeah. So um, we have a great guide that I um, I think is probably a good starting place for most of this. And I'm working with only one monitor. Um, well, while you're so looking I, at that, I have another request. If you, yeah. Can you get your IT people to look at your homepage? Because sometimes when it gets accessed on a pad or it, it, the search bar gets blocked by your menus and you can't navigate to actually do a search. It doesn't seem to be an issue on a laptop, but on other devices, it doesn't work. So you've got a, you've got some sort of HTML issue going on. Yeah, um, I think that um, I will remind them again, but I do think like UNCG is going through a website overhaul and it yeah. might include us as well. Uh, um, <laughs> because of all the plugins we use and like, you know, our catalog system being, um, you know, what a, an outside thing, like we can't control them, um, you know, we're constantly more complicated. tweak that as well. So I did, sorry, Anna, I was like delayed, but I did put the link to the Skullcom, um guide, which oh, um, thank you. Yeah. is all the stuff that Anna went over today about open access funding, as well as like an introduction to open access. Um, eventually we will put that webinar there and the slides can live there, Anna, if you um, are interested. And then- Where's um, this accessed off of the library itself, page itself? How do you navigate, how do you drill down to this if you go to the library homepage? So if you go to the library homepage um, and then uh, go to research guides by subject in that red catalog box, and then scroll down to additional research and resources guides, um, the scholarly communication guide is there as well. So if you want, I'll just quickly, if you don't mind, Anna, I'll just quickly mm -hmm. my screen. Go ahead. Um, add it here. Okay, so you're on the home page. Um, I'll go back there. And you just go to this research guides by subject. And then, you know, we have a guide on every like major uh, department at UNCG. And then you just scroll down and click on this additional research and resources guides. And they're put into categories, um, but you're looking for the scholarly communication guide. Um, so, here it is. Yeah. The communication at UNCG. Um, so, unfortunately, you know, this page just, uh, you know, it's where all the guides live on research topics like this. So, it is long. Um, feel free to bookmark it. Um, I have it bookmarked because this comes up a lot, of course, with my departments. Um, so yeah, and again, there might be a website overhaul soon. Uh, so anything you want, you're welcome to email me, um, any feedback, um, and I can send it along to our um, website advisory committee, which I'm also on. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Sam. So that, that scholarly communication guide that Sam uh, showed you how to get to, it has got a link to the Open Access Publishing Fund. It has also got a tab for other OA publication funding options. So that's what I was going through with the Cambridge University Press, Sage, IGI Global. So all that information is there. Um, and then there are other tabs about other various things. And this is, um, this guide is newly under my purview somewhat newly. So some of these I'm hoping to update more in the coming months. Uh, right. but, the, but again, if there are topics that you think uh, you want to see on here or that you think would be useful to your courses, your students, your departments, get in touch and we can um, think about trying to add those as we have time. And um, Bob, if you, you know, as your librarian, um, if you were to want um, me and, um, you know, I don't want to speak for Anna, but possibly Anna could come with me virtually to talk to faculty, uh, department heads, or anything in HHS about these issues and have it be more conversation based, um, not recorded. Uh, feel free. We could also talk to Tim, who runs a lot of our, you know, deals with these publishers too, and he could come, um, Tim Bucknell. Uh, so again, I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth, but um, I'd be happy to come to a virtual meeting um, and take down your questions and have a conversation. Yeah, about I mean, I'll, I've got, I mean, I'm an editor of a special issue with Sage Publishing. So I have mm -hmm. personal questions and mm -hmm. can the library yeah. help negotiate fees? Can we, can we 
group articles and try to get a lower rate per article. You know, I think their fees are a little bit onerous given the size of the journal. Mm -hmm. You know, they sort of have a um, one fee. Now they've got this open Sage service, but anyway, I've got some more detailed questions to ask you. But yeah, um, yeah, and if you um, if you want to, I'll I'll shoot you an email about this stuff anyway. But um, yeah. if you want to work out a time, um, we can do that. And again, it could start with me, and I could bring in who um, we need to bring in if that works too. But It'll be a couple weeks after the semester starts. But thanks. Yes, yes, <laughs> of course. Um, so just to plug again, I know people are probably leaving or have left and we're still being recorded, so I'll make it quick. The spring 2020, 20, 20, 20, uh, 2021 uh, sessions are set. I dropped that link in the chat. I will remind you again when I send an email with a follow up with this recording as well. Um, so uh, keep in mind that, that we have tons of sessions on this stuff as well as by this stuff, I mean scholarly communication topics, as well as other things to do with research and application. Um, do I have it up? No. Um, just to plug it again, you go here and I, again, I dropped this link in the chat. So we have one on lateral reading coming up next week um, as the first one in the series. Uh, it's really interesting. It's about fact checking um, and training your students on that. Um, so it's really great. And then um, funding open action, open access publishing, uh, again, on January 26, like Anna said, uh, student data sandbox by our data visualization librarian, quality journals by Anna again, um, and then Dimensions AI, which is a um, new academic kind of search engine that also kind of serves as a citation index. So if you're interested in that, um, as well as legal research. Uh, so again, if you can't, even if you can't attend them on the actual date and time, we will send you an email with the recording uh, if you can't come. So please sign up if you're interested just in the topic. Um, but that's it. I'm sorry uh, that I kept, this is my spiel. So I kept you all past 12. Um, please uh, let me know if you have any questions before I end this. Um, and then uh, do you have anything left to say, Anna? Sorry that I took over. Uh, just uh, thanks to everybody for being here. Thank you for your questions and engagement. And thank you to Sam for facilitating this and running this webinar series. Uh, we look forward to working from y'all, working with y'all, and hearing from y'all more in 2021. Yes, thank you all. Bye, everyone. Thank you for coming. I am going to stop the share and then end it. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Bye, bye. bye.